Hello, and welcome to In the Privy Council, a regular podcast reviewing cases heard before the Judicial Committee of His Majesty's Most Honorable Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog. I'm your host, Elijah Granite. This week, we're discussing the Trinidadian case of Maharaj and the Cabinet, the citation for which is 2023 UKPC 17, TNT. As Trinidad and Tobago is a republic, remember this case was decided directly by the Privy Council, rather than His Majesty. This is an important case on statutory interpretation, in light of the principle of legality, the principle that fundamental rights can only be interfered with by clear law and the principles outlined in the Trinidadian Constitution. It is also a case which split their lordships into two factions, with a majority opinion given for the board by my lord, Lord Richards of Camberwell, joined by my lords, the Lord Reed of Allermuir, and Lord Hodge, and a vigorous dissent from my lord, Lord Briggs of Westbourne, joined by my lord, Lord Kitchen. This dissent is all the more striking, because both factions of their lordships actually agree on almost all the points of principle. The background to this case is refreshingly simple. In 2022, the government of Trinidad and Tobago decided to make reforms to local government. The reforms were sweeping, but did not alter the underlying principle that local government is elected by the people, for the people. The only important change for our purposes is that the term of office for councillors was changed from three to four years. Thus, the original statutory provision in the Municipal Corporations Act, Section 11, Subsection 4, read, The term of office of councillors shall be three years, and they shall retire together on the last day of every triennial period, the first of which shall be deemed to have begun on the day on which the councillors were elected to office. The amendment to the Municipal Corporations Act substituted four years for three years, and quadrennial for triennial. It left untouched the part that read, the first of which shall be deemed to have begun on the day on which the councillors were elected to office. This leads us to the issue at the heart of this case. Were the terms of incumbent councillors extended by one year by virtue of this amendment? Or were their pre-existing three-year terms left to expire at the end of those three years? The government said it extended the terms. Mr. Maharaj disagreed and sued. After losing in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, he makes one last appeal to the board. Let's start with the common ground of both the majority and the dissenters, which my lord, Lord Briggs of Westbourne, helpfully laid out. First, the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago does not go into any level of detail about local government nor even specify a right to vote in elections for local government. Therefore, there is nothing which makes extending the terms of office unconstitutional. Second, changing incumbents' terms of office requires either clear explicit language or clear implication from existing language. Third, retrospective effect should be avoided unless the language of the provision explicitly leads to this. Lord Richards of Camberwell's majority opinion used these principles to conclude the terms were not extended. First, the language of the surrounding provisions in the Municipal Corporations Act is prospective. Section 11, subsection 1 reads, Councillors shall be elected. This meant that, although ambiguous, the natural reading was that the amendment is prospective. His lordship then followed this contextual approach with a purposive interpretation. His lordship emphasized that the central purpose of a representative democracy is that the representatives are chosen by a popular vote, and that this principle is as applicable to local government as to parliament. As an aside, the Trinidadian Senate is an entirely appointed body, but his lordship may regard second chambers as distinct. While his lordship accepted that Parliament had the capacity 
to change incumbent terms. There's a long-standing rule of statutory construction that ambiguities in legislation are interpreted so as to protect voting rights. Even though the Constitution did not specify voting rights in local elections, the democratic structure in the Constitution and the principles of it implied a democratic basis for local elections until Parliament said otherwise. And here, uh, his lordship relied in part on English authority. And of course, in England, there are no constitutional rights to anything, much less to vote in local elections. The final factor in favor of this conclusion was the retrospective effect of the extension uh, construction would have. The absence of transitional provisions to explicitly extend the terms of incumbents, as previous legislation had done with clear words, meant it was difficult to find the implication that Parliament had here, in its silence, intended the same thing it had once done with explicit language. Let us turn now to the dissent. Lord Briggs of Westbourne, as we've heard, shares the majority's principles. However, his lordship saw in the language of section 11, subsection 4, references simply to councillors, and that language clearly implies to incumbents, such as when it refers to the dates of retirement. Furthermore, because Parliament wholesale replaced the provisions about triennial terms, that would mean no law in existence set the term of incumbent councillors, which would be a drastic legal consequence, which of course interpretation should seek to avoid. In any case, no one doubted the triennial version of section 11 subsection 4 applied to incumbents. Why did simply changing the two words mean it ceased to apply to them? And of course, it would clearly apply to the current incumbents after the next election. The result is that the majority, in its eagerness for a pro-democratic construction, ignored that they had now given two shifting meetings to Section 11, Subsection 4. It did not apply to those currently in office at the time it came into force, but it did from the subsequent election, if they were to be re-elected. This implication of a special transitional period, never once referred to explicitly in the statute, was a stretch, especially because Parliament had previously chosen to extend terms rather than extend future terms when it amended local government law. The majority's view had the odd effect of delaying Parliament's goal of extending the terms, and was again a stretch. Finally, his lordship disagreed with the idea that there was retrospective effect in the change. The fact that the term of office can and was varied was known at the time of election, and the effect was prospective in nature by delaying the future end of the terms. The voters knew that the term could change. Older voters would have seen the term already change in past dates when Parliament had altered it. Thus. The presumption against retrospectivity did not apply. Turning now to our analysis of the case, I must say that I found Lord Briggs of Westbourne far more persuasive than I did Lord Richards of Camberwell. Quite frankly, the majority judgment felt like it was ignoring statutory interpretation to grandstand and with several paragraphs about the basic nature of representative democracy. Yet, this insistence ignores that local government was regularly changed by Parliament, and the fact that Parliament has the ultimate and highest democratic legitimacy, which the dissent rightly noted. Moreover, it led to an absurd construction, which read an artificial transitional period into legislation to make some point about voting rights. The necessary implication Lord Briggs of Westbourne highlights is very clear, and the idea that Parliament would have left a complete legal vacuum without any explicit transitional periods is also absurd, 
and puts the courts in the uncomfortable role of remedial legislature. Judges like grandstanding about the nature of representative democracy, but altering the term in office of councillors is a legitimate choice for Parliament to make. The plain fact that Section 11, Subsection 4, was the only applicable provision weighs quite heavily in favor of the idea that it is as applicable to incumbents as to those next elected. While courts should, of course, be cautious and zealous in defending democratic rights, that should be balanced against the intentions, which are, all agree, entirely constitutional, of the elected House of Representatives and the appointed Senate in Parliament assembled. Parliamentary democracy is at the heart of the Trinidadian Constitution, and it is regretful that the majority frustrated the clear intention of Parliament and created a legal vacuum simply so that it could spend some paragraphs grandstanding about the basic nature of representative democracy. Well, thank you very much for listening to another episode of In the Privy Council, brought to you by the Legal Style Blog, and hosted by me, Elijah Granite. If you want more legal content, visit our website, legalstyle.co.uk, or follow us on Twitter, at Legal Style Blog. If you have any comments, suggestions, rants, or raves, the email of the podcast is editor at legalstyle.co.uk. We also welcome any ratings or reviews on your usual podcast platforms. Until next time, goodbye. And remember, together we aspire. Together we achieve. <laughs>